Hello everybody. Today we're going to be rehashing the thing that we talked about in the first ever episode of Peptide Buddy. And this is Andrew Huberman's favorite peptide, Sermorolin. So he talked about it on the hilarious podcast Flagrant 2 with Andrew Scholes and Akash Singh. And um, he's the host of the Huberman Lab. Andrew Huberman's a neuroscientist Really interesting speaker. I like a lot of what he talks about in terms of optimization. And today we're kind of going to go through it. Um, I did some more research, and since it was my first video and had terrible sound quality, I figured we'd give it another go. So, pathway and a plug. So, we'll start with the plug. Um, thank you all in advance for watching this. I appreciate everyone's viewing and, you know, suggestions, comments, talking about peptides in general and kind of stimulating this conversation. It's awesome. So the only way to support us, please like and subscribe. Uh, so as far as the pathway goes, this one we're diving back into the GHRH pathway, which I'm sure we all know pretty well by now. Um, hypothalamic release of growth hormone releasing hormone stimulates the anterior pituitary's release of growth hormone, which in turn stimulates the liver's release of IGF-1. And from there on, it goes and stimulates many different functions within its target tissues. So, somorolin, also known as GHRH-129 and GRF-129, is a 29 amino acid peptide derived from growth hormone releasing hormone. So if you do, you know, your own research on the peptide, if you want to actually see articles, uh, a lot of it isn't under kind of this brand name, Samorolin. It's under these other titles, GHRH-129, GRF-129, and sometimes they target the, or talk about the amino group, the NH2 at the end. So Samorolin is one of the many GHRH receptor agonists, and it's not just a treatment for children with growth hormone deficiency, or it wasn't just that, um, but it was also used as a tool to diagnose such a deficiency and kind of confirm this diagnosis. Uh, so in 1997, that's when they started using Samorolin for growth hormone deficiency, and you'll see a lot of the research on the topic is kind of done back then. Um, it was discontinued in 2008, not for safety concerns or anything like that, but manufacturing issues out of all things. All right, let's get to the research. So as you'll see, research in the field of peptides that increase growth hormone, you know, the subject of many of these videos is tough to find and tough to analyze. There are articles showing different outcomes and we know so little about the topic because of its breadth. So for instance, the role IGF-1 is probably involved in, it's a lot more vast and a lot more detailed than people can tell you at this point. Uh, it's certainly more than I can tell you. And these growth factors and hormones are involved in diverse biochemical operations. So things big and small alike. However, um, just getting into it, IV or subcutaneously injected somorolin does cause release of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary. You know, it's a very small analog of GHRH and seems to function well. So it stimulates this rise in GH, IGF-1, and we know that it causes these increases um, from research and that it probably has effects similar to GH. The caveat with GH or growth hormone is that most of the benefits seem to help people who are deficient, like children or older people, the elderly. So in people with deficiencies, GH causes increased bone mineral density, improved lean body mass, so muscle growth uh, and or replacement of fat, so fat loss, sleep quality increase with somorolin has yet to be confirmed. So, you know, you'll see people anecdotally claiming that it helps and maybe it does. It is not at all impossible that it would help. It seems like it could. Um, but there's some, you know, brief research we can extrapolate that's been done on, you know, rainbow trout. Um, interestingly, however, in both pigs and rats, somorolin has shown improved healing and recovery in the setting of post-heart attack. So it's improved heart function and helped to repair the wounds, uh, inflammation, and cardiac remodeling. So this is kind of similar to 
uh, you know, you'll read that there are heart healthy effects of growth hormone, and I imagine it's similar to what we found here. One study has shown small rises in prolactin, luteinizing hormone, and follicle stimulating hormone. So I had uncertain next to this just because one study has shown such a teeny tiny increase and others have really shown that it's been variable and sometimes not affected. Just like some studies have shown that lean body mass wasn't changed, but oh, with the caveat that body fat wasn't explicitly measured. So as usual with these things, more research has to be done. Um, so, you know, let's get to the last part, risks. Sermoralin seems to be pretty generally well tolerated. Of course, there may be injury or irritation to the injection site. Um, also with GHRHs, I worry about things like growth of unwanted, unwanted structures, um, you know, as well as maybe increased insulin resistance or worsened control of your blood sugar, so possibly heading towards hyperglycemia. That's what I worry about. Um, but here we go. Quick cut to the chase and evidence-based episode on Sermoralin. Thank you for watching, my friends.